Hello, my name is Maciek Dunajski. I'm a fellow and the director of studies in mathematics at Clare College in Cambridge. I want to talk to you about how mathematicians make sense of curved spaces. This is a fascinating branch of geometry, which we teach to our students at their second year. But what I want to share with you today, um, you should be able to follow with A-level knowledge or below. We'll start off by um, thinking of curves. So imagine a civilization of intelligent bugs which inhabit a one-dimensional universe, like this red curve on the left. The bugs, let's imagine, know a lot of mathematics and they can measure distance. Can they determine that their universe is actually curved rather than being straight? It turns out that they cannot. We see the curve as curved because we look at it from outside and we can take into account the way it is embedded inside the plane but um, by stretching it very gently we can turn it into a straight line without changing the notion of a distance so if all the bugs can do is measure the distance and there is nothing else for them to measure they just cannot tell Turns out that um, the situation changes for the bugs living on the surface of a sphere. There, the curvature is intrinsic to the sphere, and if the bugs know what they are doing, they could tell their universe apart from, um, let's say, a plane. So I want to first explain these two concepts of extrinsic and intrinsic curvature to you. Let's start off with curves. Um, we will um, approximate our curve at any given point, let's say P, by a circle of best fit. So um, what we'll do is we draw a tangent circle to the curve at P. Now, the problem with that is that there are infinitely many tangent circles. You'll see three on this figure. Uh, we need to pick the best one. And the way we do it is by observing that the curve divides the plane into two regions. On my picture, this would be up and down. Now, some circles, like the smaller one, um, lie entirely in the lower region, and the big one is in the upper region. Now, if you change the radius of the circle continuously, you'll find the circle which separates the two um, families of circles. That one is called the osculating circle, and having found it, will declare the curvature of the curve to be a reciprocal of its radius. Well, for example, if the curve we want to measure a curvature of is a, is a straight line, then the radius of the osculating circle, or in fact, any other tangent circle would be infinite. You can think of a straight line as a limiting case of a circle with infinite radius. So the curvature of a straight line is zero. If the curve is itself a circle of, say, radius one, then its curvature is equal to one, and it's the same at any of its points. Now, you would want to be able to measure, in fact, compute the curve for um, a general graph of a function. So think of a red uh, curve as a graph of a function y equals f of x. Um, to do that, you have to employ calculus and, and first realize that what's special about the osculating circle um, is that it shares not only the second, but no, not only the first, but also the second derivative um, um, at the point P with, with our curve. Now, if you do that and, um, and do some algebra, and I think this is within your reach, this is something you can try, you'll find that the curvature of such a curve is given by the ratio of the second derivative of f um, and the expression involving a square of the first derivative. So that much for curves on the plane. Uh, let's move on to surfaces and I'm going to define a curvature of a surface by um, slicing it into curves and this concept and what follows goes back to Carl Friedrich Gauss, who was a German uh, mathematician, broadly regarded as the greatest mathematicians of, of all time. And yet what, what I'm going to tell you about um, one of his great theorems, 
he was the most proud of. Well, what Gauss says we should do is the following. Um, given a surface, which is a point, let's say this point is where the two curves cross, and slice um, our surface with planes, which are perpendicular to it at this point. And there'll be infinitely many of such planes because you can just rotate a given plane, keeping it perpendicular. Now the intersection of any of these planes and the surface is a curve. So we can compute its curvature and we can also decide that if the curve bends downwards from the tangent at the point, then its curvature is positive and otherwise it's negative. So for this surface on the diagram, this curve would have a positive curvature and this one would have negative curvature. Well, we'll now pick the maximal possible curvature of a curve we get, call it kappa max, and the minimal one, which can be negative, call it kappa min, and declare its product, call it capital K to be the Gaussian curvature of our surface at the point. And for a general surface, this curvature will vary between points. Um, the, the surface can be more curved at some points, less curved than others. So let's look at some examples. For a sphere, you see, whatever point we choose, um, the only curves we'll get by slicing it with perpendicular planes will be circles. And the circles will all bend in the same direction. So if the um, radius of the sphere is one, then um, kappa max and kappa min will both be equal to one, and so will the Gaussian curvature of the surface. Well, the surface um, of, of, of a sphere has a positive Gaussian curvature equal to one. The next example is a cylinder. You see there we have various possibilities. We can slice a cylinder um, um, in a circular curve, this would be choosing a plane which is parallel to the base of the cylinder. Um, if the base circle has radius one, then this curve would also have radius one, so its curvature would be one. But we could also slice the cylinder with a plane which is parallel to the axis, and that's a straight line. Uh, and the straight line has zero curvature, so in in case of a cylinder, kappa max equals one, kappa min equals zero, and the total curvature at any point is zero. Um, we'll say that cylinder is flat, and in fact it is. If you take a pair of scissors, you can cut it along one of its generators and flatten it to a plane. You cannot do it with a sphere. The last example, I'm sorry about that, will be a surface of negative curvature, like this saddle of a horse. Here, some curves bend um, inside the saddle, like the light green one, and others bend outside. Um, for the example I've chosen, they are both circles of the same radius, but because of going inside and outside, you'll take one radius with sine plus and one with sine minus. So the total curvature of, um, of the saddle point surface is minus. Now let's go back to our bags. Um, can they use what I told you about to measure the curvature? Well, they, they can't really because I've used extrinsic concepts of planes intersecting the surface and to do that, you must view the surface as being embedded in three dimensions. But there is another equivalent way to determine the curvature, and this is what, what Gauss has discovered. And to tell you um, how to do that, I need to define um, geodesics. So a geodesic on the surface, the geodesic between um, two points is the shortest path, if one exists, connecting these two points. Uh, for example, on the surface of a sphere, a geodesic is a part of a great circle. This is like an equatorial circle, which you'll obtain by intersecting a sphere with a plane which goes through the center of the sphere. And this is the shortest. You cannot do any better going from P to Q. Well, you might be tempted to go from P to Q along a line inside the sphere, 
but that'll be cheating because you'll be moving um, away from the surface, right? You, you, can only, you can only choose curves on the surface. Now, once you defined a geodesic, you can um, talk about triangles. So um, let's, let's, stay, let's think of a surface of a sphere, pick three points, call them A, B, and C, and connect A and B with a geodesic and B and C with another one, and also A and C, so we have three segments, three, three lines on the sphere, they form a triangle. Um, you can then um, add the angles of these triangles, and to do that, to measure the angles and to measure the geodesics, you do not have to move outside the surface of a sphere. You'll then find that um, on the sphere, which is positively curved, the sum of the triangles is always greater than 180 degrees. On the plane, you know, the sum of the angles in the triangle is equal to 180. And on the surface of negative curvature, um, like the saddle point surface, saddle pipe surface, the sum of the angles is smaller than 180. So this is one way in which um, you know, creatures living on the two-dimensional universe, a surface, can detect its curvature by, by constructing the triangles and measuring some of the angles. Um, there is another way which actually leads to a formula. You see, pick a point on the surface and, and this bit um, will not assume that the curvature of the surface is the same at every point. You could, you could, do, um, you could do that at any chosen point. So you pick a point and you look for all other points which have the same distance on the surface from your chosen point. Um, these points form a circle on the surface. Now, you know that if this was a circle on the Euclidean plane, then its circumference would be two pi times the radius. It turns out that this formula needs a modification in the presence of curvature. On um, positively curved surfaces, the circumference is smaller and on negatively curved surfaces is larger. And in general, for small circles, the, the correction to the two pi r is given by minus the Gaussian curvature times pi times r cubed over three. The dots here denote some higher order terms which, den which, um, which involve higher powers of the radius, but if the radius is small, you can neglect them and read off the curvature um, just from these. And now, um, other practical problems where curvature uh, comes into, into play and when you would want to know whether a surface is curved or flat. Well, the, the earliest of such problems, I think, go back to uh, cartography, to map making. Um, you would, you know, once you realize that the, the, the surface of, um, of our planet is spherical, you ask whether you can map it onto a plane in a way which preserves distance. And this, it turns out, is impossible because, precisely because of the curvature of the surface. There are several ways of making maps, but they all distort distances in one way or other. And I'll tell you about two. The first one is something mathematicians really like to do. It's, it's an interesting mathematical procedure, but, but not a very good um, cartographical device. We call it a stereographic projection. To, to do that, pick a point on the uh, surface of the sphere, let's call it the North Pole, and in coordinates, let's say it's zero, zero, 001, if the equation of the sphere is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Now, um, for any other point, p on the sphere, connect the North Pole and P by a straight line in R3 and see where this straight line hits the, the XY plane. And the, so this gives you some point P prime and this is the image of a point P under this stereographic projection. And you can do it with any other point on the sphere except the North Pole itself. So, um, in, in that sense, a sphere is uh, the same as a plane, because every point on the sphere has an image on the plane, together with an extra point, we call it a point at infinity, which corresponds to the North Pole. 
Now, if you use the idea of similar triangles, then you'll find that the complex coordinate of the image of a point with coordinates x, y, z on the sphere is given by this expression. And you'll never have to worry uh, about dividing by zero because you've excluded the North Pole from your projection. So Z is never equal to one. Now, um, this, uh, this procedure wouldn't be any good if you wanted to make a map uh, which represents, which fairly accurately represents distances. And that's because the regions um, close to the North Pole are mapped into huge regions of infinite area on the plane. On the other hand, um, regions close to the South Pole um, are mapped into regions of tiny area. So there are better ways, other ways of making maps. And one of them, and the one we still use today, goes back to a projection devised by um, Mercator, who has constructed, um, using a fairly ad advanced for his days, mathematics is constructed a map with a property that um, every straight line on his map uh, is a line of constant compass bearing they called rump lines um, now so you know if you if you had a chance ever to close the Atlantic on the plane uh, and uh, maybe you did it before the days of um, on-flight entertainment you would have noticed that on the in-flight map the trajectory of a plane is not a straight line, uh, but it's, it's curved, like, like this um, you know, segment here. And this is not because, as people would want to tell you, your plane tries to navigate towards Greenland to be able to refuel, but because this red curved line is in fact a geodesic on the sphere, but it appears curved on Mercator's map. You cannot because of the curvature construct a perfect map. Now let's, let's take a step back, in fact, a big step back, go back to the fourth century BC, where um, Euclid of Alexandria um, wrote what is regarded as the most influential mathematics book ever written, um, The Elements. In this book, he laid down the, well, first of all, he, um, he really, um, introduce what we think of the axiomatic techniques in mathematics. You know, first you define things and then you try to prove theorems about them. He wanted to axiomatize geometry and, um, and prove some statements about geometry of his axioms. And he formulated five of them, also called postulates. Um, they, um, Fork up intuitively obvious. First one, exactly one straight line segment might be drawn between any two points. Well, that's, you know, that's true. We'll, you'll see that when you experiment with lines in the plane. A piece of straight line might be extended indefinitely onto, um, onto an infinite line. A circle might be drawn with any given radius and arbitrary center. Indeed, there'll only be one subcircle. All right angles are equal. That's a bit odd. What that one means is if you take two right angles and you keep one where it is and the other one you translate and possibly rotate, then these two right angles will coincide. So up to this congruence on the plane, all right angles are the same. And then the fifth axiom, known as the parallel postulate, states this. Um, given a line L and the point P not on the line L, there is exactly one line which contains P and doesn't intersect L. So on this diagram you have L and you have P and the light gray line is the unique line of Euclid's axiom. Now this fifth axiom caused controversies which lasted for over 2000 years. You see, if you have a set of axioms, you'd like to know if they're really independent. So can it be that the fifth axiom, in fact, can be deduced from the first four and didn't have to be put by hand in the first place? Um, it turns out that Euclid was right um, because there is an example of a geometry, we, we now call such geometries non-Euclidean, 
where only the first four, ax the first four axioms hold, but not the fifth one. So this is what I want to tell you about next. This is called the hyperbolic geometry. And the model I I'd like to use is known as the Poincaré disk. In fact, it was discovered by Beltrami, but um, not unusually in mathematics named after somebody else. So this disk is uh, just an interior of a circle um, with unit radius. You can think of it, if you know complex numbers, as um, a complex numbers of modulus um, smaller than one. Now, what are the geodesics on this disk? Well, um, they, so what are the shortest lines? Well, they're of two types. Um, if two points you want to connect line on the diameter, then the geodesic connecting these points will be part of the diameter. And otherwise, the geodesics are circles which intersect the boundary of our disk at 90 degrees. Um, it turns out that you can connect any two points on the disk uniquely, either by a diameter or by such a circle. Now, um, having defined these geodesics, you, you then ask, is there a notion of a distance which these geodesics minimize? And, and there is. Um, and the, way you, the way you compute it is as follows. Let's pick two points, um, P and Q, and uh, connect them by a geodesic. This geodesic will intersect the boundary circle at two other points, call them A and B. Now, the distance between P and Q is um, obtained by computing Euclidean segments, the length of Euclidean segments, AQ, AP, BQ, BP, and forming this expression, AP, BQ, divided by AQ, BP, and taking its natural logarithm. And you know, that assigns a number to, um, to a pair of points, and this it turns out, and, and for that you really would want to study geometry at the second year in Cambridge or somewhere else, it turns out that these geodesics minimize this distance. In fact, this um, is a curious notion of a distance because um, the points on the boundary of a disk, if you were to compute the distance between such a point and the origin of the disk, you would find that it's infinite. So the boundary is infinitely far away from the origin. And this explains the paradox of this um, tessellation of a disk, which I took from one of the pictures of uh, M.C. Escher, a famous Dutch artist uh, who visualized many concepts in hyperbolic geometry. There are angels and devils on, this, um, on these pictures. And from our Euclidean perspective, the devils uh, towards the center appear larger than those near the boundary but they in fact all have the same size, but you have to take the hyperbolic distance into account. So, so this, you know, you, you can check uh, that all the four axioms of Euclid, the first four axioms are satisfied for this model, but the parallel axiom is not. Um, because um, let's say we take point Q, you'll see that there are two lines this one and that one, two geodesics on the disk, which go through Q, and they don't intersect this geodesic, which doesn't go through Q. In fact, there are infinitely many parallel lines, uh, well, lines which are parallel to the diameter, which go through Q, but don't intersect the diameter. So that's, that's a non-Euclidean um, geometry for you. The parallel postulate fails, and the Gaussian curvature, if you wanted to look at the triangles on this disk model, you would find that its angles add up to something less than 180 degrees. And in fact, its Gaussian curvature is negative and everywhere equal to minus one. Now, um, to finish off, um, I'll move away from surfaces and I'll talk about curvature for um, concepts in higher dimensions. I'd like to talk to you about the curvature of the universe. You see, I'll, so I'll step up in dimensions, but I step down in precision and rigor. Um, we think of curve as one dimensional. It has one degrees of freedom. 
A surface has two degrees of freedom, for example, a long longitude and latitude in the sphere. Um, from um, well, what we learn in Einstein's theory of gravitation, we should think of um, our universe as four-dimensional space, we call them manifolds, and, uh, we, and, and this one will be called space-time, consists of three space and one time dimensions, um, and it's also curved. Now, the um, message from Einstein's theory is that the um, gravitation we perceive is in fact an effect of the curvature of space-time. So here you have a picture of a planet circling a very heavy star, and it looks like this planet is moving along a curved trajectory. In fact, it's moving along the shortest possible path, but on the curved space where the curvature is caused by the star. Now, um, Einstein's equations um, make this precise. I'm, I'm writing Van Berghoff symbolically here. Um, they tell you how um, mass of the universe, or region of the universe, um, is translated into curvature. We now know, um, both um, from observations and analysis of Einstein's equations, that there exist regions in, in the universe where the curvature is infinite. There are two types of such regions. The first one is the Big Bang, which we think of as the beginning of our universe, beginning of space and beginning of time. And then there are black holes. The black holes uh, arise from um, collapsing of very heavy stars, where the density of these stars becomes so large that the gravitational attraction pull things together to infinite density. So in, 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 inside black holes, physics as we know it breaks down. Um, uh, mathematics just about tolerates infinities, physics does not. We don't know what to do. Um, and that I think is a good place to stop. Thank you.